For all this I considered in my heart, even to declare all this, that the righteous and the wise and their works are in the hand of God. No man knoweth either love or hatred by all that is before them. All things come alike to all. There is one event to the righteous and to the wicked, to the good and to the clean, and to, and to the unclean, to him that sacrificeth, and to him that sacrificeth not. As is the good, so is the sinner, and he that sweareth as he that feareth an oath. This is an evil among all things that are done under the sun, that there is one event unto all, yea, also the heart of the sons of men is full of evil, and madness is in their heart while they live, and after that they go to the dead. For to him that is joined to all the living there is hope, for a living dog is better than a dead lion. For the living know that they shall die, but the dead know not anything. Neither have they any more a reward, for the memory of them is forgotten. Also their love and their hatred and their envy is now perished. Neither have they any more a portion forever in anything that is done under the sun. Go thy way, eat thy bread with joy, and drink thy wine with a merry heart, for God now accepteth thy works. Let thy garments be always white, and let thy head lack no ointment. Live joyfully with the wife whom thou lovest all the days of the life of thy vanity, which he hath given thee under the sun, all the days of thy vanity. For that is the portion in this life, and in thy labor which thou takest under the sun. Whatsoever thy hand findeth to do, do it with thy might. For there is no work, nor device, nor knowledge, nor wisdom in the grave whither thou goest. I returned and saw under the sun that the race is not to the swift, nor the battle to the strong, neither yet bread to the wise, nor yet riches to men of understanding, nor yet favor to men of skill, but time of chance happeneth to them all. For man also knoweth not his time, as the fishes that are taken in an evil net, and as the birds that are caught in the snare. So are the sons of men snared in an evil time, when it falleth suddenly upon them. This wisdom have I seen under the sun, and it seemed great unto me. There was a little city and few men within it, and there came a great king against it, and besieged it, and built great bulwarks against it. Now there was found in it a poor wise man, and he by his wisdom delivered the city, yet no man remembered that same poor man. Then said I, Wisdom is better than strength. Nevertheless, the poor man's wisdom is despised, and his words are not heard. The words of the wise men are heard in quiet, more than the cry of him that ruleth among fools. Wisdom is better than weapons of war, but one sinner destroyeth much good. So here we're continuing on our study of Ecclesiastes, as I mentioned. Uh, this one we're talking about is called One Event. This sermon's called One Event. Now in verse 1 he begins by saying, For all this I considered in my heart, even to declare all this, that the righteous and the wise and their works are in the hand of God. No man knoweth either love or hatred by all that is before them. So here we see that we don't know something. We're lacking understanding in some area. We need to learn. We need to grow in this area. And as we talked about earlier on in Ecclesiastes, we can go and we can learn from our surroundings. We can ac accumulate knowledge from studying nature, from studying how things behave in nature, from studying uh, the, the ways of, of the, the cycle of the earth, how, how we, we see animals interact, how we see people interact, and general things about creation. We can gather and bring them together and gain some sort of knowledge and wisdom and understanding from the creation that's always going to be a somewhat incomplete understanding. But here it says, in the hand of God is where we find true wisdom. The hand of God is where true wisdom comes from. And that is where right works are founded upon. We need to understand these two things. If we're to know anything, we only know it by the grace of God and what he has revealed to us within his words. This far surpasses the creation because this is knowledge that descendeth from above directly from the hand of God the Creator. And right works in the same way are founded upon the knowledge that we learn of Him. 
We see that the wise, we see that their works are all within the hand of God. Deuteronomy 8.18 even says this. It says, it is he that giveth thee power to get wealth. Any power that we have to go out, to work our day, to do the labor before us, to do our tasks, is all given by God. He gives us the power to get wealth. He gives us the power to do the works that he has. He gives us the wisdom even to do those things. Here we see that love and hatred and the discernment of them both are known not by what is before them. So no man knoweth either love or hatred by all that is before them. In other words, true love and true hatred and understanding of those two concepts does not come from what's before you. You cannot see nature and understand it. Nature is very brutal to each other. There's no love in nature. There's no hatred in nature. It's simply animalistic the way they go at each other. They're simply trying to feed a carnal desire that's been set in them. And God has made them so. So we're not going to know love. We're not going to know hatred hatred but by understanding God and the discernment that he gives us comes from him only because our hearts are always going to be bent to do wrong if we were to look at nature and how it interacts one with another we would see a lot of our own hearts reflected in that we would react wrong in situations giving love where love is not due giving hatred where hatred is not due and not the right course to take our heart is always going to deceive and twist these situations unto its own self gratification unto its own self wants so we need to understand then God and the hand of God in order to interact properly within this world verse 2 says this it says all things come alike to all. There is one event to the righteous and to the wicked, to the good and to the clean, to him that sacrificeth and to him that sacrificeth not. As is the good, so is the sinner. And he that sweareth is he that feareth an oath. Verse, verse 3 says, This is an evil among all things that are done under the sun. There is one event unto all. Yea, also the heart of the sons of men is full of evil or harm. And madness is in their heart while they live, and after that they go to the dead. So the one event there is highlighted and, and talked about in the beginning of that portion. It comes all to the finalization at the end. It says, they go to the dead. So that is the one event that happened to us all. No one is escaping from that. Whether you're righteous or whether you're wicked, whether you are clean or whether you are unclean, the end of all is the dead. We are all on a road, a one-way path unto death and to the grave. What be lies beyond that is not the direct scope of what Solomon is talking about, because he always wants to talk about what's going on in this earth. What's under the sun is the, the framework of what he's trying to discuss. What we need to see then, though, from this understanding is that there is hope for you, but only in as much as you are living today. If you are alive today, there is hope. There is still opportunity for you to what? To yoke up with God, to take hold of the hand of God, to live the life that God has for you because he is reaching out that same hand unto you. You're going to die. We're all going to die, whether we're righteous or whether we're wicked, whether we're unjust or whether we're just. The heart of man is full of evil. There's madness in our heart while we live. Then we go to the dead, but there is hope for us even now as we stand here because we're still sucking air. We're still alive. There's still moments left in the lifespan that God has given us, and we need to use those to benefit the end goal. We need to use those towards God's purposes and God's plan for us. Verse 4, for him, for to him that is joined to all the living, there is hope. And that's what I said there. There is hope for you if you are joined unto the living. Why? For a living dog is better than a dead lion. Now you may be sitting here today and wondering to yourself, well, you know, I have this mangy mutt of a life. I have the, I'm, I'm a dog, I, I'm, I'm lower than a dog, I'm just, I'm just a beast, my life I've dragged through the mud, I'm living it not in God's ways, not according to God's will, but it's, it's just a dog, well if it's a living dog, hey, it's better than where your life a roaring lion. What we're highlighting here and what we're focusing on, what Ecclesiastes in the book that Solomon wrote is trying to say is that, hey, the hand of God is where you're going to find wisdom, it's where you're going to find the right words, that's where we need to be. The end of all men is death, but while you are here, whether you're living as a lion or whether you're living as a mangy mutt, you know, flea-bitten, no good, rotten dog, right? The end is 
that we're all going to die. But if you're a living dog, you're better than a dead line. You're better than the bold line. You're better than the noble line. You're better than the king of the jungle, even though you were a dog. If you are living, there is still time for you to order your steps. There is still time. There is still hope for you to do what God has for you. Verse 5, it says, the living know that they shall die. And we all understand this, right? We're alive. We're breathing. We know that there is a finality to our lives. And every time we think about things like that, there needs to be a sombering feeling that comes through it. We need, to, we need to sober, we need to smart up, we need to wise up and know that there is a finite time that we have before us, but that we know that it is better than the second part of this verse. It says, but the dead know not anything. Neither have they any more a reward, for the memory of them is forgotten. So understand, again, you have hope. You know that there is time left. You know that it is short. And you know that it will come to an end where you will breathe your last breath. If you're alive today, you at least know that much. And because you know it, you can use that to benefit you in the next moment, in the moment after that, in the day after that, because you know that there's a finality to this life. Use that. Understand that you have a brevity. Understand that time is short. Every moment counts. Because if you are dead, you know nothing at all. Physically speaking, there is no more opportunity to gain rewards. So we need to contrast these two ideas in our head. If you are alive today, there is still time to gain rewards in heaven. There still is time to make a memorial for yourself. There still is time to be sure that what is left after you pass away is not soon forgotten. The memory of the dead is already on its way to expiring, and it will be no more. You're alive today. You have an opportunity today to do something right with your life. Verse 6. Also, their love and their hatred and their envy is now perished. Neither have they any more portion forever in anything that is done under the sun. But you're alive. Your love is here and true. Your hatred is here and true. Your envy even is here and true. And it remains. And, and, and all the emotions that are driving you by day by day, by moment by moment, are still alive, are still flowing, are still doing what they intend to in this world. But what we need to do now is to take the sobriety that comes with knowing that you have a finite life to use for the glory of God and to use to solidify your memorial, what will be remembered of you after this all comes, after that one event happens to you, you need to take your love, you need to take your hatred, you need to take your envy, you need to take your raw emotions and choose to retain some, choose to remove some, choose to rightly deserve what opportunity you need to apply one and what opportunity you need to apply to other in order that you can mold your current portion under the sun. Solomon is here explaining that, hey, life is short. You're running out of time. And he keeps saying this throughout the entirety of this book, teaching people how to live right in this life as he had great understanding of the truths of it. He said, hey, money, wealth, fame, fortune is not going to do it for you. But living your life right before God is what's going to do it for you. So understand there's time. You can turn this around. Your life may be mangy. You might be a dog in your life. But you can turn it around because you still have time. Here's a challenge that he sets forth to the living. He presses on in this understanding and in this passage of scripture with a challenge to those that are still breathing a challenge to those that are living dogs and it's better than being a dead lion those that still have time left to gain rewards those that still have time left to ensure that their memory is not soon forgotten verse 7 says go thy way eat thy bread with joy and drink thy wine with a merry heart for God now accepteth thy works so the challenge first the first challenge that we have here verse 7 is to go to, to get on your way, to stop sitting around sulking, to stop moaning about how wrong your life is or how hurtful your life is or how it hasn't turned out the way you want it. Your past is weighing you down. No, he says, go now. Move forward. Press on. Enjoy now with a thankfulness, with a heart that rejoices with contentment in what you have. Take the next step 
toward where you want to be in your life before God and take that step with thankfulness that you even have the step to take, the breath to get you there. Go with contentment that you may not be where you want to be tomorrow or the day after or the day after and you've dragged your life through the mud and it just looks so bleak. But go with that same thankfulness, contentment about where you're at with what you have on to the next challenge that's before you. Why? For God accepteth thy works. You've got to understand that if you are going in the spirit of God, you are for, if you are going with God's leading, that he accepteth your works only in him if you're being led of the Spirit. Verse 8 says, Let thy garments be always white, and thy head lack no ointment. So enjoy then the extras. Enjoy then the finer things, the blessings. We know that whenever we talk about wine, we're always talking about something that most people just don't have access to. To have the crushed grape off the vine. To have that, that, that delicacy that most don't have access to all the time. You're enjoying something of the finer things. Here, white garments is brought up as something. The ointment is brought up as something that you are to enjoy, you are to rejoice in. Here in Canada, we have so many more blessings than the rest of the world. Why can't we enjoy those finer things and be content with such we have and move on? So the first challenge then is to go and to enjoy your life with a thankfulness and a contentment with what God has given you. The next, to enjoy the extras, the finer blessings. We have been blessed beyond what we can even imagine here, thanks to God and thanks to his blessings placed upon us where we are living at. Verse 9 says, Live joyfully with the wife whom thou lovest all the days of the life of thy vanity, which he hath given thee under the sun, all the days of thy vanity. For that is thy portion in this life and in thy labor which thou takest under the sun. Two things that I see here. The one, how he highlights the vanity twice and he brings to brings to uh, the forefront the idea of a gift. So he says here, God has given you this thing. He has given you this life. And you're to live joyfully in it. That's, that's, that's the, how he, he began this whole phrase. He says, enjoy this life that God has given you. He says, the life of thy vanity. And again, the life of thy vanity. All the days of thy vanity. Just bringing it to the point that, yes, days are vain, and days are passing, and days are fleeting, and you're running out of them moment by moment by moment. You ought to be doing the right thing with every, one, with every single one that you have. But he says that all the days of thy vanity live joyfully. And how often do we let one day, two day, three day, four day slip by, and we haven't been joyful in them. We haven't rejoiced in them. Hey, you're saved, and when this life ends, this is going to be the worst of what's to experience after. It's hard. Times are hard. Times are tough here. We all go through challenges and we all face difficulties, but the end is heaven. The end is glory for the children of the king. We need to understand that while we're here, it is our responsibility. It is our duty. It is the great rejoicing that we have, that we can experience a joyful life. We don't have to be bogged down by miseries, and we can do it not just the life of thy vanity. We can do it all the days of thy vanity. Enjoy that gift. Embrace that gift. And have it draw close to you. Have you understand and really, with a content heart, rejoice in the things that God has given us. Here he, he says specifically with your spouse, with your wife, with your husband. Add to this your family. Add to this your friends. Anyone who is a loved one in your life. You are to diligently try to enjoy that gift of time with them. Though life seems vain, though the days pass by, live joyfully in each and every one of it. Do the best you can to honestly embrace the joy that Christ has given us. And the joyful Christian life comes from being in Christ, comes from being in His will, comes from doing what Christ set forth for each and every one of us. And we have the opportunity to take those days that are passing by us, to take those years that are passing by us, receive them as a gift, and do something good with them. The best thing that we can do with them is rejoice with those that God has given us to share them with. So there's two challenges. The first, go enjoy, be thankful for it. Uh, enjoy the extras, even the finer blessings that God has given you. Enjoy these things with the ones that you love most. And verse 10 says this, Whatsoever thy hand findeth to do, do it with thy might. For there is no work, nor device, nor knowledge, nor wisdom in the grave 
whither thou goest. Again, the end of all men, right, is death. That's awaiting all of us. And in that time, once the grave is our final destination, we know that there is either heaven or hell to wait. But Solomon, again, his primary focus is upon the earthly uh, living, what's under the sun, not what's beyond there. But he says, hey, while you're here, whatsoever your hand findeth to do, do it with thy might. How often do we just drag ourselves through days? How often do we just pull ourselves, you know, groaning and mourning and weeping and, and it's such a drag to get through our daily mundane tasks? You know, something like washing the dishes. Oh, it's, it's nauseating. This is so horrible. My hands are all, all wrinkly. You know, something like mowing the grass. Oh, my back hurts. This is awful. No, instead of dragging yourself through what you need to do, what your hand has found to do in that moment, do it with your might. Put something into it. Put your strength into it. Put your mind into it. Put your body into it. Put your focus into it. As, you, as if you were doing whatever mundane task as unto the Lord, do it so even in this life. With whatever your hand findeth to do, do it with your might. This is encouragement to grow. Because anytime you do something with your might, you get stronger at it. Think about lifting weights, right? You go and you pick up 10 pounds and you're like, whoa, and you lift them as hard as you can, right? And you're sore the next day. But you next time you'll lift those 10 pounds, it'll be a lot easier. You'll move up to 15 pounds. We'll do that with your might. Okay, now you've moved on to 20, to 30. You keep going. You keep getting stronger because every time you go to do something in this life, you're doing it with all you have. And eventually, you'll look back upon the things that you have done in this life, and, and, and it'll, be a, it'll be like, wow, that was so easy to get through, right? Because you're now at a spot where you're doing greater works with all your might. And, and the things that you did when you were this big and the things that you did when you were this tall in Christ are, are just nothing in your sight. You become stronger. You become wiser. You become more knowledgeable. And the encouragement then is to grow. Labor stronger with your might. You know, engineer something. It says here, it says, nor device. So devise something. Come up with something. Be cunning. Be, be ingenuitive. Be, be, be always thinking about ways to do things better. Do that with your might. Knowledge, wisdom. These are areas that you need to grow in. And the only way you're going to grow in is by always pushing the limits. Always doing whatever your hand findeth to do with thy might. Pushing it to the next level. That way you're always growing. You're always in, getting to the next level. You're becoming a stronger person. You're becoming a stronger spirit. And it motivates you to want to achieve more. And while you're here, well, that's the least that you can do. You can try to grow in the life that God has given you. Try to do the best with what you have and do your best in everything that comes before you. So go, enjoy this life with thankfulness. Enjoy the extra blessings. Enjoy the family that, it, that God has given you, the ones that you love that have surrounded you, and do all of these things with all of your might. We don't need to half do things. We don't need to, to just, just kind of drag our way through our life. We should be trying and endeavoring to do the best, to be the best. And that's the greatest testimony at your workplace or in your home or, or with, with family members. If you're always somebody that is trying to be the best at it, not because they're trying to show off to others, but because they're motivated by a verse like this, whatsoever thy hand findeth to do, do it with thy might. There's no glory in that. It's simply you rising to the challenge. It's simply you taking what God puts before you and doing it the best that you can. We're trying to act out our life as if we were doing all of our servitude, all of our labors, all of our toiling, all of our struggles as unto Christ. God did so much for us. The least we can do is take this vain life that we are living and live it to the max. Live it as best as we possibly can and always endeavor to do things to the next step. But here we see that we don't always have to, to, though we're pushing the limits of things, we don't have to, um, I don't know how to put it, but almost like push ourselves to where, where we're just exhausted, where we're, we're broken down. We can do things at a reasonable pace in this life. Because if you, if you think about it, God in the end manages all the outcomes, right? He is the one, when, when, I, when I go and I do a job, he's going to be the one that determines the promotion, right? Promotion comes from the north the Bible says. So he's going to manage the outcomes of what my labor outputs, right? He's going to control if I get a raise for doing a good job. He's going to control if I get complimented for doing a good job. But in a lot, in a lot of ways too, though, God doesn't always micromanage everything in our lives because we saw that. Either he manages the outcome or he completely doesn't. 
So we shouldn't spend our lives always fussing and fretting or toiling and trying and pushing and pulling through life as if it's some of this, this struggle. Because in the end, everything is vain, right? All of it is vanity. We are trying to please God in this life, and this life really means nothing. It's just a shadow. It's just a vapor. It's just something that passeth away and is soon forgotten. But still, the commands are clear that God wants us to achieve a certain level in our lives, and it is joy. That's the bottom level line. Joy is what we're trying to achieve, and joy comes from what's being described here. God wouldn't be describing or encouraging us or challenging us in these areas if it wasn't going to benefit us, right? God doesn't give us commandments that are harmful for us. He gives us commandments that will help us. Verse 11 says, I returned and saw unto the son that the race is not to the swift, nor battle to the strong. Neither yet bread to the wise, nor yet riches to men of understanding, nor yet favor to men of skill, but time and chance happeneth to them all. And this is what I mean, where, where God controls the outcome in some cases, right? If I do something, God will bless me for it. If I, if I give, God will give unto me. Or, you know, hand pressed down, the Bible says. He'll, he'll shake together the blessings so that he can pack as much into our vessel as possible. Possible when we give unto others. That's what the, the, the type is given, right? God will bless us and control the outcomes of decisions that we make here, but sometimes it just doesn't seem to work out that way. And that's why I said, don't be always fussing and striving. You get frustrated when things don't fall in line the way you expect when you do good and you want good to be returned unto you. This, this, is, this is a vain way of living this vain life. Because you need to understand something like verse 11. It says, the race is not to the swift. The battle is not to the strong. Neither yet bread to the wise, nor riches to men of understanding. We would think that all of these things, if you were wise, you would gain bread. If you were fast and swift, you would win the race. If you were strong, you would win the battle. And that's the logical step that we take. But sometimes God doesn't intervene in that way. And sometimes things don't just happen the way we would expect them to. But the end of that verse says, time and chance happeneth to them all. There is kind of a randomness to this life because there's so much going on and God is a God of free will and he doesn't intervene in every aspect of man's lives. His intervention was when he came to this world and died on a cross. And then now he says, whosoever will may come, right? He, he didn't come in and, and, and uh, into this life and said, all you must worship me and just gather everybody together. No, he came down, died on the cross and still left free will intact when he returned unto glory. Free will has not changed, and therefore the randomness of this life has not been interrupted. Therefore, therefore, we always have the opportunity to do what we will, and the results don't always follow suit where God just intervenes and makes, I did good, I received good. I did bad, I received bad. He doesn't intervene in that way. The world kind of has its own way of balancing those things out. And how does that work? It happens by time, and it happens by chance. Verse 12 says, For man also knoweth not his time, as the fishes that are taken in an evil net, and as the birds that are caught in a snare, so are the sons of men snared in an evil time, when it falleth suddenly upon them. So even something like death, you would think we would have some sort of way of predicting it or understanding it. But even as the fish is just going along and the net scoops him up and he's gone, is the same way that men pass away. Even as just a bird that is just flying along, lands itself, is taken in a snare, is gone. Neither of those beasts were considering or thinking or planning that to happen. It just happened. In the same way, death seizes suddenly upon a man as time and chance interact in this world that we're living in, that sort of downward spiral that we're all caught in, where everything is constantly degrading when it's all just falling apart. As we're caught in that, we need to understand we are subject unto those same things. It can be sudden, right? We could live another 40 years of this world, or we could live another 40 seconds of this world. And neither one of us can guarantee either. We are, have all been made subject unto the randomness, unto the ways of this world, this degrading of this world, and we're subject unto it. We can suddenly pass away. We need to be always considering these things because every moment that you have is a moment that you can choose whether you're going to live it for God's glory or when you live it for your own selflessness or selfishness. 
You need to understand that, hey, God's ultimate goal for every one of us is that we would rejoice in all the labors that we have to do. We would seek to find something to do with our hands, and we would do it with our might to the end that God would be glorified, yes, but to the end that we would actually enjoy the vain life that we have here. But we need to understand, too, that we can make the decision to do wrong, and, you know, the end is the same for both of us. But when that end comes, that was, that's what the wise take to heart. They understand that, hey, they have a short time, a short opportunity whereby we can gain, like the Bible said, we can gain rewards. We can gain a memory that isn't soon forgotten. So whether we're doing great works over the next 40 years or 40 seconds, whether we're doing the menial tasks for the next 40 years or the next 40 seconds, the end is the same for all of us. So, what's, what's the benefit of it? Well, like I said, look at verse 13. It says, This wisdom have I seen under the sun, and it seemeth great unto me. There was a little city, and few men within it. And there came a great king against it, and besieged it, and built great bulwarks against it. Now there was found in it a poor wise man, and he by his wisdom delivered the city, yet no man remembered that same poor man. So the end of this man was just non-remembrance, right? There was nothing to remember of this man. And even as I was studying this out, I went looking for the story. I think I remember a story in the Old Testament where, where a man delivered an entire city. And it was probably just one of these in Judges where it was just like three or four verses or something like that. But I couldn't remember it. Um, if that's the actual story or not, I'm not certain. But either way, it, it proves the point, right, that, that his name was not remembered. I couldn't remember if there was a reference to this story in the Bible. But here's the truth that he's trying to present to us. Um, that there is... Here, a little city that was saved for 